So, okay, we, we want to uh, get right into things and learn about compassionate listening from Camille, who's really nice to wake up really early and lead our discussion today. But just as another reminder, and I'll start posting this on the screen so everybody can read it, but just another reminder what spiritual enrichment is and what this group was formed together um, as WCC's Ministry of Faith Exploration and Formation, uniting head and heart in pursuit of an honest and vibrant Christian faith that is open relevant, faithful, and transformative. We also put together a mission statement, which if you give me one minute here, just nice to, I like to be reminded too. Our mission is enriching minds, expanding faith, and transforming hearts. Our values, we here believe that spirit, the spiritual journey is a lifelong process. Throughout our years, we continue to explore deep questions, examine ethical challenges, and grow in wisdom, compassion, faith, and connection with others. We grow by drawing on our Christian heritage, the wisdom of the ages, the inner spark of our own spirit, and being recognized and heard in thoughtful conversations with others. Independent thinking is welcome. <laughs> so, with that, let me mention one more thing, please. I'll just tell you the rest of the month the programs are going to happen. Next week, we're going we're going to hear from. Um, uh, the nature township, because I think a lot of us are not aware that there is poverty in our area. I mean, there are people struggling to make it. And we're going to hear a little bit about how the nature township uh, services, how they affect and touch lives in, in the township, because we've just really never explored that kind of thing. So, and then two weeks after that, we have um, Marla's uh, yoga teacher. Taught her as an instructor, my wife's teacher, is going to talk about the deep spirituality behind yoga because you don't hear much about that. And yoga is a big phenomenon in our world, and it's highly practiced by so many people. Even if you have not done it, I think you'll be interested in the interfaith aspect of like that. And then the week, the last week, uh, first week in October, my wife will follow that up talking about uh, her own personal journey, spiritual journey. Uh, Marlon, my wife, will come and she'll talk about how she got into yoga and how she does that as a Christian, from her Christian faith and how it enhances her Christian faith. I think it will be interesting, even if you're not a yoga person, and you probably know people who do yoga that are in the church that are, tell them to come. They'll still hear some things as well as maybe some spiritual chance and breathing things that you can put into practice without us getting out on mats or anything here okay <laughs> so uh that's kind of what's happening so it's the, the next three programs yeah. oh. we're just kicking off yes and do you know whether this camille dickerson is part of the dickerson news family well we could uh, ask her about that and then i know <laughs> Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what I do now. <laughs> Camille, we're, we're ready to get going if you are, but can I uh, just tell yeah. me a little bit about you? Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. So this is Camille Mullins Lemieux. She we're is Dickerson Lemieux now. I just got married. <laughs> oh, wow. forgive me. Dickerson Lemieux. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm sorry, Camille. Interrupt me if I have made other mistakes, but. I understand that you are a mothership maven. <laughs> undergrad, she has lived in multiple communities, including a Zen monastery and a jungle eco town. These experiences spurred her interest in understanding uh, why conflict happens and how to get through it skillfully. This eventually led her to earn her master's in reconciliation from the University of Winchester. Her most important values are being kind, being authentic, and creating beauty everywhere. Neil has a passion for content creation and loves working with compassionate listening facilitators to get the message of this work out there. She's been creating art her entire life and is so inspired to have the chance to bridge her two passions, reconciliation and art. Neil deeply believes that everyone has a story to tell and has the right to be heard. We just don't always know how to communicate it. So Camille, thank you again. And um, we're here to learn from you. Yes, thank you so much for inviting me. I am so honored to share about this wonderful work. Um, I am the Mothership Maven, uh, but technically my 
that's like my nickname for the organization. Uh, but I am also called the managing director of the Compassionate Listening Project. Um, and the Compassionate Listening Project um, empowers individuals and communities to transform conflict and create cultures of peace and healing. And we accomplish this through workshops, facilitator training, listening journeys, and partnerships with humanitarian, social justice, and peace building groups. And these offerings cultivate practices that hold courageous and generative space to bring people together across difference. Um, so that's our mission statement. But on a human level, I'm sure that you have all experienced conflict at some point in your life. Um, and I wonder if, like me, you've ever thought that if the person you were in conflict with just listened, wouldn't it be resolved? <laughs> um, but being the first to listen in a conflict can feel impossible if you haven't learned the skills. Uh, and sometimes if you try to listen, it can feel like you've only made it worse. So the Compassionate Listening Project is kind of meant to be a guide um, to be a better listener. Um, so I want to introduce you to Jean Nudson Hoffman. Um, she is the philosopher behind the Compassionate Listening Project. Um, she was an international peacemaker and founder of the USSR US Reconciliation Pro Program uh, for the Fellowship of Reconciliation. She is also a student of Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese Buddhist monk. Uh, he was a really powerful activist in Vietnam uh, who really advocated for nonviolence. Uh, and then the concepts of compassionate li listening were further developed by Leah Green and other dedicated individuals who are now facilitators of the work. Um, and Jean Nudson Hoffman, the way she originally conceived it, compassionate listening uh, is meant to be non-judgmental listening and deepening you're not supposed to ask not uh, adversarial questions. Listeners seek the truth of the person speaking and see through the masks of hostility and fear to the sacredness of the individual. Uh, listeners accept what others say as their perceptions and validate the right to their own perceptions. And in this way, listeners seek to humanize the other. Um, which can cut through barriers of defense and mistrust, en enabling both the, those listened to and those listening to hear themselves in new light and to change their opinions and to make more informed decisions. Through this process, fear can be reduced and participants will be better equip equipped to discern how to proceed with effective action. So, um, Later on, Leah Green, who is the founder of the Compassionate Listening Project, took these philosophies from Jean Nudson Hoffman and founded the Compassionate Listening Project. Um, but before that, in 1990, she embarked on a journey that began as the Mideast Citizen Diplomacy, uh, which is a part of the Earth Stewards Network. I don't know if you know what that is. Um, and she had a deep pa uh, passion for the Israeli-Palestinian Israel reconciliation work. Um, and so she started to organize delegations that went to Israel and Palestine uh, to foster connections between U.S. citizens and reconciliation leaders on the ground in Palestine and Israel. Um, and to be, to improve those uh, delegations, she adopted Jean Nudson Hoffman's teachings. And, um, and then, uh, which, which humanized contact and cultivated compassion between the Israelis and the Palestinians and the US uh, delegation members. 
Um, and because of this marriage between these Israel-Palestine journeys and Compassionate Listening, she created the Compassionate Listening Project and guided over 800 American citizens in 34 delegations to Israel and Palestine and expanded the work to offer compassionate listening tra training just by itself, since it was so helpful for people. Um, and there are still journeys to Israel-Palestine taking place um, today. So we have a journey to Israel and Palestine uh, this November from the 4th to the 15th. If anyone is interested, there is still time to join us. And we have also launched a new journey. Well, it's been around for a couple of years um, to Alabama to talk about uh, civil rights and to open up dialogue between people of all sides. And that's taking place next year on January 8th through the 16th. And we have more plans to continue to expand these projects. So the heart of our work in compassionate listening revolves around these five core practices, cultivating compassion, developing the fair witness, respecting self and others, listening with the heart and speaking with the heart. So cultivating compassion is meant to, so you learn to develop empathy, um, experiencing and communicating gratitude, developing your ability to forgive and developing a willingness to step into another person's shoes uh, seeing and feeling the world from their perspective to the extent that we can. And that also includes self-compassion, learning how to uh, self-regulate, to be more able to hear difficult things, um, and just practicing opening your heart and developing that flexibility. Um, the second is developing the fair witness. Uh, and with this practice, we cultivate an ongoing process of self-exploration and the ability to hold both complexity and ambiguity. And we learn to step out of the difficult interaction enough to notice what is happening on a meta level in our minds, emotions, bodies, and spirit. And we learn to recognize and contain our triggers or reactivity and suspend judgment enough to stay connected with each other and listen fully to another person's story and perspective. We learn to separate the impact of someone's words or actions from their intention. Uh, and then, the third is respecting self and others. Uh, and with this one, we take responsibility for our own part in what's unfolding and how we impact each other. We learn to hold healthy boundaries and are both protective and permeable, trusting that each of us has the capacity to resolve and heal our conflicts. Often just being heard allows us to take an important next step in that direction. And then listening with the heart uh, requires quieting our minds so we can be fully present to others, genuinely seeking to know who they are and what they value, and the experiences that motivate their perspectives. Learning to listen with the heart, whether to ourselves or to another person, always opens doorways to deeper understanding. It requires shifting the focus from our active minds to the energetic core of our being and keeping our own stories and interpretations out of the way. Then, uh, which makes listening a real gift to people. If you're listening with the heart, then it becomes a gift. And then once you have done all four of those, you might be ready to speak with the heart. Um, 
which means that we seek to access and convey our own deep truth from as close to our heart as we can get. The language we choose reflects a healing intention rather than words of blame or judgment that may cause someone else to feel reactive. If we seek more information, it is out of a genuine curiosity rather than to disprove the other person's point of view. And we reframe issues to get at the essence of underlying needs and feelings. And we courageously choose to give voice to what has truth and meaning. And we do all of this for, to seek to promote healing. Um, so that last piece is important um, because you don't have to do compassionate listening with everyone. <laughs> you have the right to choose um, who you feel you have the capacity to do compassionate listening for. And uh, it's always it's always great to move outside of your comfort zone and choose to broaden your mind and your heart. But um, if you don't feel ready for it, this is just an option uh, where you can you can try to um, cultivate these skills. So we are going to do an exercise, which is very simple in some ways, but very profound in other ways. And it's just going to be listening with the heart. And um, so we're going to pair up and we will each get to experience being a listener and a speaker. And so uh, the speaker will speak for three minutes and we, and the speaker will have to speak for three full minutes. Um, and there are no, there are no rules. I'll give you a prompt so you'll know what to start with, but um, there's just, you just have to talk the whole time um, and speak from the heart about your experiences uh, and not your interpretation or judgment of the, the experience. experience. Uh, you're invited to tune into your body and when you feel you're disconnected from your heart or going into a heady explanation, you can just take a moment to breathe and return to what you're feeling in your body and the wisdom <laughs> of your heart. And yeah, uh, so, and then the listener, since this is compassionate listening, we get to really focus on the experience of the listener, but um, I invite you to hold and center the speaker's experience with a loving presence. Uh, in your mind, try not to slip into the fix it mode or advice giving mode. Um, listen to their story without trying to relate it to a story that you have. Um, practice listening from your heart rather than your head. Um, this is means listening for how it feels in your body rather than an analysis in your mind and how it makes sense. Uh, Try to stay present even when you feel emotionally activated. If you, you might not. Um, and if you start to not be able to pay attention, just like get back to your breath, just like remember to be in your body. If you find your mind watering, but wandering, oh yes, it says it right here, take a deep breath and return to listening and reflect on what the speaker says to make sure you're understanding internally. and leave room for silence so as the listener you you're not going to respond it's just going to be three minutes of uninterrupted listening time um and you're just gonna explore how that feels <laughs> uh and you can you can like go like you can little noises but Oh, sorry. I think someone's speaking. Oh, I just saw the speaker speak on time. 
Let's go to the next one. Jesus, grant us that. Hallelujah. The next one. Go to the next one. Go to the next one. If you can't understand, she said she's speaking and she feels the spirit and she's speaking in tongues. Oh, nice. Beautiful. Yeah, so um, I invite you to pair up and. So, I'll let the bridge over here. Okay. Let's okay. see, we have three people uh, other than you who are at home Carol, Nancy, and JS. Um, would you like to pair up with one of them and let the other two um, pair up? Yeah, sure. Well, um, will you be able to keep track of three minutes? So that people can switch, okay, and, and okay. every, and whenever you switch, uh, just like everybody needs to pause and take a deep breath, and don't you don't respond to what the person said. It's just like it's just an invitation for people to be heard. Um, but you can thank you can thank each other. You can in the in, in between but no reflections or anything like that just for this exercise. So there's no, there's no, when you're listening, you're not responding in any way. You're just listening. Yes. Responding internally, but you're not trying to speak or, or even encourage. You're just listening. Yes. That yeah. That's and um, you're just like becoming a, a space, like inviting someone into a space of caring and connection through your listening. And what what would be a good? Uh, do you have any examples of what people talk about? Because people coming yeah. up with yeah. yeah. this, this is a the question that you will be exploring, which is what is a challenge in your life right now? Oh, I'm sorry. What is a challenge in your life right now? Right. Okay. A challenge. A challenge. A challenge. A challenge. A challenge. Not the most important. Just no, something. yeah, that's that's a three minute challenge. Yeah, I can't wait too long. Okay, so Carol, Nancy, JS, how should I? Do, do you see what the screens? Can you um assign yourself room one or room two? I think that you have to assign it for them. Okay, who shall I assign? <laughs> <laughs> Carol and Nancy, okay, I'll, I'll come in. I'll try to put you in a room. <laughs> Carol and Nancy. And then Camille and Jess. I'll open those rooms. You've never done that before. <laughs> okay, like I'm going, works. I'm joining the room now, so oh, I'll I see you guys in, in six room. minutes. See you all in six minutes. I need one more thing. Okay. Good job. Well, actually, oh no. Okay. See ya. <laughs> How are we going to divide up here? Everybody just want to pair up? Okay. Can everyone pair up? Three minutes of talking to you. Yeah. 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 Pair up. Well, then we have to move, and I'll start second. Okay. Right. I'll, I'll take one start. All right, one second. Y'all start yet? Have you started to take a time? We have three minutes. It's like a I'm sure everyone's got an arm. Okay. Okay. 
So you were not able to you were able to bring her in, but she didn't want to hear very right after what's it called? but it worked good Twenty four seconds. We'll switch. Okay, I invite you to uh, Finish your last statement real quick and then connect to like, switch roles. <laughs> and you can switch now.
They were closing the breakout rooms and uh, everyone, everyone turned so we could be careful we're learning and not sure who leads to that. Alan, you need a whistle. Okay, everyone. Yes. Thank you. Neil, do you hear us? Yes. There's Carol. Carol, can you hear us? Nancy, I see you. You can hear us? Okay. And Camille? Um, looks like she's still in room two with JS. <laughs> can you boot her out? <laughs> no, that would not be very compassionate. <laughs> Camille, JS, are you, are you still listening? To each other? Us? <laughs> All breakout rooms will close in one second. There we go. That's all down here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are we back? We're back. There she is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We have you. I see everybody. You've both got mute on. So, Nancy, Camille. Thank you. Yes. So, how how was that for everyone? What was that experience like? Anybody want to share? Transformative. Very transformative. Transformative. I think what happened in our situation, we both realized that we've encountered some very serious situations and that maybe we can be a benefit to each other as if we were listening to each other. So I, I don't think this is a normal situation when you're thinking of people who are loggerheads with each other. But uh, we had a very powerful conversation. I would say. Because of our each of our experiences, yeah. but we were listening to each other. <laughs> really, <Yes. laughs> uh, anyone else? Uh, did anything surprise you? We have a hand. Yes, Vince and I found it very hard not to make a comment to the other person about <laughs> you know. You know to, to stay in the listening mode and right. not maybe the solver mode or something. You want to say, yes, I understand. Yeah, I get I it. I, the same yeah, way. right, right. Mm -hmm. So Camille, what, what should we do about that? Or should, I mean, if the listener really wants to agree you know or mm -hmm. respond. Yeah, it definitely takes practice and um, it can feel kind of unusual in the beginning to, to just be like, oh, I'm just listening right now. Um, <laughs> But uh, there's, there's, it's, I think there's something pretty magical about live, leaving space around something, uh, around someone to just like really have their hands on the steering wheel of a narrative. Um, because, you know, it's sometimes, I mean, yeah, sorry. <laughs> There, there are skills later on in compassionate listening where you do learn about how to respond in a way 
that fosters listening. Um, but in the beginning, it's just good to like notice what happens in your body, what your instincts are, and just to be aware of them uh, so that you can be skillful in how you you choose to listen. So it's just an exploration and and in regular day-to-day -day conversation, there's like no right way to listen. Um, but this practice is just an exploration and and maybe like over the next over the week or something you can just like ask yourself why do I have that instinct to help people and give them advice or you know it's just interesting to know yeah mm -hmm. uh, if you're listening and agreed you have a way of with your body, making that obvious. You nod or you smile or something. Um, and I wanted to know whether that's acceptable in this program. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, that is also something to explore. <laughs> um, some In the early days of the Compassionate Listening Program, usually I tell people to not nod and make any sounds just to see what that's like um because there there is a way that sometimes when you nod or you're like oh yes like that's like people can sometimes change their narrative to like keep getting that validation from people rather than just being completely honest about their experience but but there's nothing wrong with any way that you're currently listening. You're you've you know been doing it your whole life. But it's just it's an exploration. So I don't want anybody to feel ashamed of how they're currently listening. <laughs> Andrew, you got a question? So I was wondering if you, you don't react to that, what do you as a listener, how do you benefit from it? How or how does it help you? Because if somebody is telling you something and right, you know what they are saying, the approach is totally wrong. But in the other mind, they are saying the right things or they, they want you to hear them and you know it's wrong and you don't say anything. Mm -hmm. How do you, how, how does it help you? Either you or the person you're listening to. That's a good question. Um, well, if you know what the other person is saying is wrong, or you feel that it is wrong, I think that there is power, there is something important about, <laughs> okay, so compassionate listening is a tool and you don't use it all the time you know if if someone is like coming into your house and robbing you you don't usually do compassionate listening to them because you need to protect yourself or you know so that's not a time when compassionate listening would arise unless there's a crazy situation where <laughs> where they want to be listened to compassionately. But, but compassionate listening, if you want to listen to someone you disagree with, compassionate listening can be helpful because you learn to just bring the conversation back down to earth, back down to like a grounded place. And there's lots of spaciousness and it's not in a place of reactivity because when you're when you're very reactive your half of your brain like literally it your i forget what the part of the brain is it just you flip your lid and you are in this like fight flight or freeze part of your your perception and so there's not a lot of space to communicate and to for either side 
And so compassionate listening brings everything back to your full access to your brain so that everyone can slow down and everyone has the chance to evaluate what is happening in the conversation. And, you know, sometimes I think the intention of compassionate listening isn't to change anyone's mind, but it is to humanize the other. And through the process of rehumanization, connections can be built and we may never change anyone's mind, but at least we can see the whole person and then begin to create cultures of peace. Mm -hmm. So it's not, this isn't, reconciliation in general is not like a quick process. And, and it is also, it's a stage of the conflict map. So it usually comes at the end of a conflict. It's not like well, there's like war on this side and there's reconciliation on the opposite side. And you can only go in two directions on the scale of conflict. And so you can use compassionate listening to move away from war, but there are also lots of other tools in the middle that might be more su supportive to like create protections. So, what, so what, what, what I like about this, what I'm hearing is you're trying to, it, this is one level of listening that's not the same kind of listening you do when you're trying to resolve a problem. This is more just building a base level of trust and withhold, learning to withhold our judgment, which is a gift for ourselves to me. Because I'm always making judgments when someone's talking. We all we all do, I think. But I'm hearing it's it's it builds a level of trust and ability to just let another person be and not have yeah. to change. Correct. Um, I I understand that, but I just think Andrew's question is so relevant for me because I think. You know, yes, when I'm talking to people right. of like minds, it's so easy and so great. But do you have suggestions for, because, and I want that grounded, being able to listen to everyone that way. But if I'm listening to someone who I think is making errors of fact, mm -hmm. errors of judgment, mm -hmm. errors of possibly an entire worldview, because let's just say, for example, I think that everything they listen to is propaganda. What do I do to, to get that grounded feeling? And I, I saw your list of the listening, but do you have specific suggestions if my mind is, I, I understand being react, non-reactive, and maybe that's just the best place to be, is not expressing my outrage <laughs> um, in any way and, and trying to contain it. But if my mind is screaming at me, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Any other ideas or or is that that it? It's just try or do I say to myself, don't don't be reactive, don't be reactive, don't be reactive and, and eventually maybe I can calm down. And <laughs> I guess the best thing I can think of is I say, okay, this is this person's worldview. This is what is and kind of stop fighting it. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the topic of the age. <laughs> um, and it's it it's pretty challenging to do it, like <laughs> explain everything in this one hour conversation because there are lots of tools that you can use um, that more than just, I think the first step is to get grounded and um, just like, give yourself compassion for the challenges that are coming up in hearing this, these, the person that you are struggling with communicating in this way. That's the first step. And then if you feel ready, you can go into exploring um, or wondering about the other person's facts, feelings, and values. Like what is, 
what is the what are the facts and the feelings and values that are coming up for them that they feel they need to protect um and that's why it's coming out so intensely because they're they're like everyone holds all of these fundamental values and I wish I had a list of all of them, but there are things like belonging and connection and safety and um, freedom. And if you listen for the values underneath of what people are talking about so intensely, it you can begin to humanize that person. And um, because, you know, you can also empathize with the desire to be safe and to belong and um you can also um ask deepening questions kind of along the lines of discovering someone's values um not any questions with I, there's there's a whole system of how to ask deepening questions um and yeah, there are just there are a lot of things. You're not helpless, uh, and but it takes practice, and and we're not really given a lot of these skills in our life, you know, growing up to to really know how to listen to people, and de-escalate conflict. Uh, so, so you're really saying compassionate list, or what I'm hearing you say is compassionate listening is the a first step in a whole series of um, steps we can learn to de-escalate conflict that we encounter. Yes. Yeah. And I want to make sure, uh, sorry, the friends at home, uh, Nancy, mm -hmm. JS, Carol and John, any thoughts, questions? Well, I, I don't have a question, but I have a, I, I uh, Oh, you're on mute, John. Oh, well, you're on mute. You. You are... John, you are on mute. Carol and John, we can't hear John. Carol. Uh, I've been I've been muted for some time, so uh, I'm kind of used to this. But what what I wanted to say when I was a reporter for uh, for for the uh, Chicago Tribune, and uh, while I was learning how to be a reporter, uh, I. Um, I learned uh, several things about this. I, I would be interviewing uh, people who who were, in, in my opinion, were kind of stupid, but um, <laughs> but I would quote them. This person said such and such and such, and then I let it go. Now in my mind, I I have my feeling about it, but what I what I report, what I write in the in, for for this, this story in the paper, is this is what the person said, and, um, and so uh, so, so I, I've, I I guess I've been sort of playing that game anyway. So uh, I just wanted to let you know. Yeah, I um I did something um very well. I woke up one morning and I had ordered some information, some coloring books for Maui, Maui, Hawaii for the wildfire. And I must have ordered them ahead of time because when I turned the TV on, they had the disaster. So they got the um, information over there. It was just a few coloring books to give to the children. And I just wanted to read the scripture I, that I had found with it. It says, follow the way of love, even with desired spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in tongues um, does not speak to man, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him, but utter mysteries with his spirit. So I said that, and a lot of people are saying that that was um, such a um, very bad thing that happened, but I sent coloring books there, and it happened in timing, and I turned the TV on, they hadn't televised it yet, but I had gotten in the mail, and it was, um, when I called, they said, it's hard to get, they don't have no one to pick it up, and I said, it doesn't matter to me, um, God led me to send that to them, and if they get them, they get it, so we hope they do able to get us, I hope so too, you know, because they, they had a transportation situation going on, and I was like, you know, God has favor, he'll take care of it, and make sure that someone, 
use it appropriately. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, I'm going to just share. Oops. Okay. Oh, well, I, I don't know how to form this. Um, I keep thinking that I have a goal in all this and, um, you know, convert or something. Mm -hmm. uh, but so uh, the question is, is it some of that? Do, is, are these um, steps? to get people to come together in one idea or are people supposed to have their own ideas? That's a great question. Um, hold on one second. I'm just gonna show the last slide while we speak. Um, so that's a great question. Um, and it really depends on the people who you speak with. Um, but I think really what is most likely to happen is that everyone involved will increase their ability to see nuance and everyone will have a greater worldview. So it's like right now, I'm like this and right now the other person is like this and but when we're in conflict we're hitting each other <laughs> you know it's like we're rocks but my hope in a conflict is actually that we will both relax and we'll both be able to create a broader world together um, that can include greater nuance and compassion and respect and and maybe that means that we adopt each other's beliefs but more likely it is just to create understanding and um you know an ability to include more of each other in our world um and there are some stories about you know, people who just were listened to and um, they, you know, changed their whole life. But there is so much, you know, that goes into our beliefs. And, uh, you know, our whole sense of belonging can be wrapped up in our values and our whole lives. <laughs> there's, there's, there can be so many experiences that shape us. And, and harden our beliefs and so I think over time it's it's just like it if we listen to each other instead of the people around us being these like symbols of a of an idea of like a political party or like a religion or all of these things, they become just an individual and they become far more complicated than just that ideal, just that symbol. So by listening to each other, we become a lot more than just like these fixtures of the places that we belong. Who's the mayor of Winnetka? Um, Winnetka, Illinois. Sorry, you don't have a mayor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't hear you. A, a local question about our, the village of the president of the board for the village. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk more about that next week because we'll have the new chair speaker here. Yeah, that's next week. week. So, Camille, you, you mentioned it sounds like. Maybe that's what I'm going to take away more deeply than anything else for uh, the speaker to learn. And you've done research on this, I guess, that a speaker should know or what it does to them when they realize someone's listening to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I just about, I think about marriage too, because, you know, you don't have to think too far, <laughs> too far away. Mm -hmm. And, and when you're married, because if you're upset and you disagree about something, and and I'm just not going to hear my spouse or she hears me, 
it would just continues the conflict. It's almost like you, even if you think they're completely wrong, mm -hmm. understanding how they feel it and why they feel it to me makes sense because it it frees us at least to get the animosity out of it to like we value each other. Then maybe a conversation can be happening. Mm -hmm. That or the differences where I just see this completely different than you said, but I just think sometimes we say it so quickly we shut down the conversation. Uh, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, this makes a lot of sense, and especially a first kind of step as it is like a trust building thing. Mm -hmm. And um, and I working as a marriage counselor, boy, yeah, you know, sometimes you just <laughs> you just couldn't get people to this place because it was so much built up. Mm -hmm. I think that's a case right now for a lot of us with the, with the political, social things we have. We feel so strongly about what we feel that there's hardly room for conversation until we see the other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's sort of my experience with doing marriage counseling with people. You've got to be reminded of the other person's value mm -hmm. and uh, understand where they're coming from or you just can't get anywhere. Yeah. yeah sometimes it feels like the other person is an alien and it's like how could they possibly think that <laughs> you know but yeah. but it's like you have to come in from a different a different side where it's not about you and right. their experience is real guys continue i'm going to worship i gotta get ready what would we all should be doing actually yeah Here's here's our information. If you would like, you can use this QR code to get to our website. Um, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram and join our email list. And you can learn more about our journeys and our heart-to-heart -heart talks and our workshops. So wow. I really thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a great place to start being a better listener. Social media. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. Thank you so much.